Join me for a conversation with writer, game designer, and podcaster, Sean Merwin. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. All right, guys, not only do I have an incredible interview for you today, but today is a special occasion. This episode is episode 100. That is right. I have done 100 of these interviews for you guys. And let me tell you what, it has been some kind of adventure. There are days when I want to give it up. There are days when I love it. There are days when I don't want to see an audio file again. There are days when I cannot wait to get up and interview some awesome, awesome guest. So I have gone through a range of emotions and feelings about this podcast now for a couple of years. Oh, I just want to thank you guys so much for listening. And it is always exciting to see the listens and the downloads keep going up and up and up. So I know that you are out there and that you enjoy this show. um, And that makes me feel awesome. So I would just like to say... If you enjoy this podcast and you like these episodes, please consider supporting the show in some way. If you would like, rate, review, or subscribe to the show, that would mean a ton to me. Right in the podcast app where you're listening to the show, you can just press a button, hit the five stars or whatever it is, or thumbs up or whatever the subscribe button is, uh, wherever you're listening. Uh, Those things really help the show. Or if you could just take a few minutes and write a review, uh, let people know what you like about the show, that would be incredible. If you would like to support the show financially, you can join my other patrons at patreon.com slash dicegeeks. That support there just lets me know that I should keep making this show. And you know, guys, it has been an experience, like I was saying, starting this show to see where I've come from. Uh, back when I started the show and to where I am now, it is just crazy um, how many more books of random tables I have been able to produce. I've also written a novel called The Spaceport Gambit, uh, which is now available on Amazon.com. The novel, I know, is a little bit outside of tabletop RPGs, although we are writers, we are creators. I think it is just natural that I as a longtime game master, you know, starting when I was nine and continuing to run games down through the years that I just love stories. I want to tell stories. So writing a novel is just an outgrowth of all of that creativity. If you were to visit Amazon.com and search for the Spaceport Gambit, I would be most appreciative. I think you can see the influences in my novel writing from West End Star Wars games, from D&D. So if you would check that out, that would be awesome. It's called The Spaceport Gambit. Just search for that on Amazon and it should come up. And you know what, guys? Things aren't slowing down, okay? I am still recording these interviews. I am still writing books. I will have more tabletop RPG resources coming to you very soon. I will have more novels coming out because I just can't stop writing them, it seems. Kind of all of that surrounding the fact that this is the 100th episode of the podcast. As you can tell, I am just really excited about that. I hope to be able to do a hundred more episodes. I just want to thank you so much for listening and anybody out there who enjoys these episodes, feel free to reach out and let me know what you think about the podcast. Let me know how I can get better. But yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much and uh, sorry for the ramble, but it is a special day. But also I have an incredible interview. Here it is. My guest today is a writer, game designer, and podcaster. 
His credits include the Acquisitions Incorporated Sourcebook for 5e, as well as Star Trek Adventures. Sean Merwin. Sean, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Matt. It's great to, uh, great to talk to you. No problem. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, so uh, when did you start throwing dice and uh, pretending to be a wizard or whatever? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's a long story, as, as most of these origin stories are. Sure. Uh, I have a feeling we're both sort of children of the late 70s, early 80s. Yes. Yeah. And so, so a, lot of the, a lot of our origin stories in this sense are, are similar because we didn't really have a lot of other entertainment back then. It wasn't like you could, you know, sit down and put in your Xbox or, you know, play virtual reality games. We were ba- barely in the Space Invaders age at that point. Yeah. Uh, so, so when I was roughly, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, the, like I said, I lived in a, uh, a very rural area. We didn't even have cable. So we got like one blurry channel of TV. (laughs) So my entertainment was books and games. And uh, a friend of mine was the only person I knew who had an Atari 2600. So during one winter break, when I was invited over to his house, you know, that was the, the excitement. We got to play Space Invaders and Adventure on the Atari 2600. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that his older brother was down in their basement playing a game some role-playing game i didn't even know what that meant but they were down there but we couldn't go down because you know they were cool middle schoolers and (laughs) we were still in elementary school so we weren't allowed down there uh until some of the people that were supposed to play with them failed to show up Uh and they needed they needed players so they're like hey you two come down here it wasn't would you like to play because you know older brothers it's you come down here so (laughs) we we went down cellar and we were put a piece of paper and strange dice were put in front of us and we were told you are playing dungeons and dragons and and you are going to roll this die and you are going to say this and you are going to do this so it wasn't playing so much as being told what to do but uh, still, it was the most amazing thing that I had ever seen up until that point in my life, being a, a huge fan of fantasy and a huge lover of games and, and understanding mechanics of how things work and ideas. So that was my very first experience with the game. And I barely remember it except remembering that I really, really wanted to do more of that. And, uh, they had just switched over this gaming group had just switched over to playing a D and D after playing basic D and D and they decided then and there that they loved a D and D and that basic D and D was crap. So <laughs> they're just like threw out their old box sets of, of like, you know, their, their basic rules. I'm like, uh, could I have those? They're like, sure. <laughs> that's terrible. Now we've got advanced <laughs> dungeons and dragons. So, uh, I would have never been able to afford uh, any of the books, but someone had tossed them out. And so I got to take them home and poured over them and read over them. And even though I never really played basic, uh, I, I got the gist of what the game is supposed to be from reading those books. And, you know, from then on a child with not many other entertainment avenues and a very, uh, you know, an active imagination, you you couldn't stop me from playing D and D at that point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, No, that is awesome. And it, uh, it does sound similar to my story as well. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I was, uh, I played for the first time when I was nine in around 1982 and it was because of my older brother and a friend of his. Right. Yeah. 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 And it was, it was weird because those games back then, whether you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons or any of the other TSR games or any of the role-playing games that were coming out, they were not ones that were easily learned by reading a book. No. And you couldn't go on the internet and watch 700 how-to uh, yeah. videos or watch stream live stream games. Mm-hmm. So you really learned by playing. Yeah. And the interpretation of what a game was varied highly from one group to another you could go to a game across town with a different group of players and play a highly different game uh, than the one you might play with a different group just based on the interpretation of the rules they had or how they decided to fudge those rules to make it to be the game they wanted to play with that group yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, I totally remember doing things in our little group uh, with my brother, you know, my older brother and his friends and his, and uh, his brother and, and then playing, you know, the first time someplace else and just being told like, that is not a rule, right? Like this right. Is not, you know, we don't do that here or whatever right. it was. That's yeah. not a rule, but the thing they were doing wasn't a rule either. Yeah. Most likely. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was, it was definitely sort of a, a game that you, you rolled your own uh, as it were and ended up still having a great time because just the concepts behind the rules were, were so, you know, were so creative and, and so uh, enticing to, to people that want to tell these stories yeah. that the game was going to thrive no matter how good or how bad the rules were. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, I completely agree. And I, I played mostly basic back in those days, kind of in the early and mid eighties. I, and, but when I say play, right. I mean, I put quotes around that because, yeah. um, we told stories and we did things with dice and we had things that look like character sheets, but I don't think, I don't, I don't know how many rules we followed, <laughs> you know, or anything like that. But, um, uh, really the first game that I remember being able to read and playing by the rules was the TSR's Marvel, uh, superhero. Mm -hmm. um, that was just like, um, you know, I would have been like 10 or 11 when I bought it and it was just so easy to read and the rules were right there and it was just awesome. I remember playing that one a lot too. Yeah. And, and that's, it's great. I never, I didn't have that experience. I went the top secret route, mm. uh, you know, that, that game is the espionage sort of, uh, James Bond themed game. Yeah. And it was again, equally fun, but the rules were not necessarily clear or uh moved you in a direction that that led to ease of play so you again were, were fudging things the first campaign i really remember running was actually a crossover between D D and top secret where these secret agents went back in time and <laughs> and were you know running i was running them through the D D uh, modules from from those days but they were Use you know shooting guns and fighting ogres rather than uh, you know fighting secret agents or or you know the commies or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds awesome. Now, did yeah. you uh, uh, did you kind of start uh, you know running games really quickly, or did you play for a long time before you ran your first game? Uh, I played for a, a few years because the group that I played with. Uh, contained these older kids mm -hmm. who who wanted to be the DM, but within a few years, we set up a rotation where someone would run their campaign that would last six months to a year, and then we'd get tired of those characters, and then the next person would take their turn. So, throughout high school and then throughout college, uh, we we had a nice system. One. DM that we had loved the Forgotten Realms. So that's where he set his game. Uh, and the other DM and I created our own homebrew worlds. So that's where we ran our games. And and it, it and I learned from them because they were great uh imaginative DMs. And so, you know, it was just as fun for me to watch them DM as it was for me to to uh to DM because I learned so much from from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. When you have, you know, examples like that, that is really cool. Um, what were some of the lessons that you learned from them? Just that, uh, the, the game itself is a collaborative game and they had played before I joined and they got out of their system, uh, all of the sort of pitfalls that a group might have where it's the DM versus the players mm -hmm. or, you know, you get the one player that wants to play the evil character and, and mess up <laughs> everyone else's fun. So I, I learned right away that, you know, when I came in and if I had some of those tendencies, they were, they were slapped out of me uh, <laughs> rather quickly. You know, when they said, no, we don't do that. And, mm -hmm. and they were pretty, kind with their explanations of why right because if everyone's playing evil characters there's a good chance somebody's not having fun or you know all all of those things that you learn um as a player right away almost uh 
was just instilled in me instantly. Uh, you know, let give the players choices. Don't take away the player's agency uh, within the story. You know, all of those things, they just sort of did automatically. So I didn't have to learn it the hard way. I could just see that they already had learned those lessons. Yeah. And so it was when I, when it became my turn to DM for them, uh, I had that, all those lessons instilled in me. And, you know, I was as much trying to win their approval uh, as, as anything else when mm-hmm. I was running the game, which is what you want as the DM, right? You want your players to have fun. You want them to enjoy it. So rather than being the adversarial DM where you're going to teach the players a lesson, or you're going to, you know, dictate to them this grand story that you're going to tell it's make everyone happy, get, bring everyone into the fold and, and let's, you know, make this a, a truly communal experience. And so all of those things help me right away, you know, sort of learn those lessons of what D and D should be and can be when everyone is playing toward the same goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Cause I totally did it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it can be hard and it can really ruin someone's experience yeah. for a long time. If, if they have to yeah. go through that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, we we want to stay positive on the podcast, but yeah, I did all that stuff. I uh, I did the 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 GM running the you know you will follow my story and yeah. like it you know and the, right. the evil character and all that stuff. I did all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and and it's you know it is it is part of the learning experience. You you know it's uh, it's the the famous quote from uh, who wrote the play Waiting for Godot. Oh. Uh, Samuel Beckett, yeah, right. Ever tried, ever failed. Try again, fail again, fail better. Uh-huh. Right? That's how we learn, right? We fail and we fail and we learn, and and so it's not it's not a mark of shame to have to go through that. It's it's just the natural learning process. And some people are lucky enough to be surrounded by people that make that learning process smooth and less painful than it than it is for others. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, it, it took me uh, it took me a while to realize what I was doing, but fortunately, you know, um, I don't think it, it it cost me any lifelong friendships or anything. Although <laughs> it, yeah. it might have came close a couple times. I remember we were <laughs> we were ready to you know we might have been ready to throw down a little bit, and <laughs> you know it as uh, you know twelve year olds in our you know and, you know on a Saturday evening or whatever. But uh, <laughs> nothing too nothing too bad. Right, N- nothing. <laughs> terribly drastic and of yeah. course at, at that age anything can set you off so you know, yeah. it's not like we didn't have tension at all yeah. in, in our games it was just some of some of the worst of it was gone yeah yeah yeah, yeah no kidding um or uh, because then you still always have the uh you know why is he or she getting all those great things and it's like well because you keep rolling bad <laughs> right exactly yeah. well exactly. i don't want to roll bad anymore <laughs> Right. Who gets that ring of three wishes? Oh yes. boy. Right. Yeah. Throw that down on the table and, and all sense of community goes out the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're just talking here, you know, and I, like I said, and I, I had a similar, you know, kind of experience where the role-playing games just captured my imagination and I was just, I was just hooked from like the instant, like, you know, they showed me like a pre-gen character and was like, okay, this is your character and you get these things. And now we're going to roll this strange, you know, 20 sided die, which I had never seen before. Um, you know, wh- why do you think that role-playing games just capture our, our imaginations like so easily and so like completely in some cases? Yeah, it's, it's for, I think it's different reasons for different people, but, but in the end, our brains love a story mm-hmm. uh, our, and we get those stories so many different ways, especially now uh, before it might've been, you know, watching a show or watching a play or watching a movie uh, or reading or telling being the storyteller and the modes of storytelling have vastly increased over the years. Uh, but that hasn't diminished our love for, hearing a story and for many people participating in telling a story. 
uh, whether you're the main storyteller or you're, uh, you know, part of a group. And that, that has gone all the way back to you know, people sitting around the fire, you know, talking about why there are these funny lights in the skies and the amazing creatures that they must be to, to be living out there. And, you know, it just, it, throughout history, throughout our generations, that love of storytelling has not and probably will not diminish. So role-playing games have always been a, a, a new and different vehicle for people uh, to, to tell. And now uh, with the, with the uh, increased popularity in streaming, a way to hear stories. So I think we've, um, you know, we've, we're able to capture that, that storytelling uh, need in game form, which is great. And some people love games. Um, mm -hmm. So you can not even be into the story, but role-playing games are, um, as I like to tell the students that I've taught uh, in my game class, uh, they're machines, right? Games are machines. And some people just love to, see how things are built and love to build things. And so when you uh, place this beautiful game machine in front of people, they want to tinker with it and they want to see how it works and they want to see how they can make it better, how they can break it, how they can make it go faster, how they can make it bigger, how they can make it smaller, but still work. You know, all of those innovative minds that, that love ideas and, and how things fit together want that as well so i've always said the two things i love most in this world in terms of not people but in terms of ideas are stories and games and when you put something in front of me that's both a story and a game uh you're hitting me right where i live yeah yeah absolutely uh and now, of, of course, you weren't even just content to play role-playing games and then become like an accountant or something. <laughs> you yeah. uh, you went into uh, game design and writing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what Just your love of the games then uh, kind of pushed you in that direction? Well, it did. As, as, soon, as, as soon as I started playing role-playing games and seeing their breadth and their depth and the different games you could have and the different ways you could use them, I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But this was during the early 90s, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And there were probably 10 people in the whole world who had real full-time jobs in role-playing games oh. uh, because there was no open gaming license like there, there was for third edition and there is now for fifth. So unless you were living for some, you know, for some reason living in uh, Wisconsin, or happened to graduate with somebody who was already at TSR or Chaosium or one of the game companies that was going on back there, you didn't have much of a chance. Mm -hmm. And so the, the odd part of my career is that I sort of came into the career the, at the moment I gave up on the career. Uh, so after college and after grad school, I had... Yeah, I had sent stuff to Dungeon and Dragon magazine and it never happened. And this was back in the snail mail era where you would type up your manuscript on a typewriter and put it in an envelope and send it away. And maybe if you were lucky three months later, you'd get a nice rejection. So it wasn't the, in the instantaneous uh, communication we have now. So I had fi finally just said, you know, this role playing game thing. It's not reasonable that you're not going to make a living doing that. So uh, I went and I was going to teach, but then I ended up getting a job uh, as a technical writer for a software company, like every good history and English major does. <laughs> uh, and, and so I was happy doing that. It was uh, a company that I believed in. I'd helped start and I was happy. Uh, I went and I got my master's degree in creative writing just because I needed to write, uh, like physically, mentally, I, it's something I need to do. So I may as well get a degree doing it in case anything ever came of it. And I, I'd, I'd sort of trailed away from, from D and D and role-playing games, started focusing more on writing, did a little bit of creative writing teaching. And then my, my daughter was born right at the same time that third edition D and D came out. And so I was like, huh, 
my wife is going to be home from work on maternity leave. She is also a player. Maybe we'll get and start playing D and D again. This third edition seems interesting. Uh, and we didn't have a lot of local gamers uh, in our area. So I had heard that there was going to be this living campaign called living Greyhawk, which was an organized play campaign where you can sort of order the adventures and find people in your area who you could all play. And it, it takes the place of a home campaign essentially where you can level the character, but play anywhere or play with anyone. And it seemed like a reasonable thing to try. So I uh, got involved with that. And the first adventure that I received uh, from from the local group, local being New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, because each area in the Living Greyhawk campaign uh, were in control of their own adventures. So I, I looked at this adventure, and to be honest, it just really wasn't very good uh, in terms of both a D&D adventure and in terms of a manuscript. And so I, I, trying to be positive, I wrote to the people in charge of, of our area, and I said, hey, you know, I'm a... I'm a writing teacher, a uh, creative writer. Can I help? Is there anything I can do to help? I'm not looking for pay because these are all volunteer positions anyway. And, you know, I, I'd be happy to edit. I'd be happy to write, I'd be, whatever you want. And my, the response I got was, no, thanks. <laughs> okay, no problem. So, so we continued to play and, you know, the adventures were okay, but they definitely could have been better. So I, a couple, you know, months past few months past i'm like hey you know just checking in again here here's something i wrote are you, any interest in this and they're like no <laughs> <laughs> so after after a few months of that again i was almost ready to give up and they're like oh could you do this for us uh, create this small region of of keoland in the in the uh greyhawk uh setting i'm like sure so i wrote it up sent sent it into them and they're like, hey, you know, thank you for this. Could you also do this? So, so I slowly started to get work. Now, work in quotes because this is all volunteer stuff. But again, my mind is, I have to write. It's just something I have to do. So I may as well do it for something. And uh, and so finally, I became one of the administrators for this region of of the Living Greyhawk campaign, and put out two seasons worth of adventures, which is about 20 adventures total uh, for that. And that got my foot in the door. People saw that the work I was doing was, was fairly decent. So then I got uh, some work for the larger campaign as a whole, and then from Wizards of the Coast directly. So it was right at the time when I'm like, oh, I, I'm never going to work in this field that I started getting work in this field. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's incredible. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I just find that story fascinating. Uh, no, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, just kind of from there writing these adventures and you were saying some of them weren't that great, but then you were, you know, so you were wanting to add some material. What, what would make a good adventure in your opinion? Uh, it's strange because a, a good adventure is a user manual. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had been a technical writer. I was a technical writer at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was highly, highly invested in writing good user manuals. So, you know, I would get these adventures that would either be super imaginative and the story would be great, but it was, it was presented in a way that was difficult for DMs to understand. Mm -hmm. you know, or it would be a very straightforward adventure, but it would lack sort of the surprise. It would lack some of the, the grit, some of the drama that makes a good D and D adventure. So, and, and I had some experience with that through, you know, creative writing, through fiction writing, through, uh, you know, drama writing and so on. So yeah, I was just, really all I wanted to do was teach at that point. You know, I wanted these writers who were writing this stuff to, to get better at their craft. I wanted to be playing these adventures and say, Oh, wow, this is great. And so that was my, my first thought was how, how can I, you know, tweak these? How can I help these writers? Uh, because while, while adventures are user manuals, they're also many other things. They're, they're drama, uh, 
right? The, the main characters in the drama are the, the characters that are brought to the table by the players, but you still want tension and you still want rising and falling action. And you still want all of those things that makes a good story that our brain wants so much. Uh, and but then there's also the mechanical parts so you want the format to be clear and easy to read you want the skill checks or the ability checks in the right place and you want the monster stat blocks to be correct so that dms can use them and so all of those things it's it's very it's difficult to write a really good adventure because of all those reasons and some people you know, who come to me and say, I want to be a writer, they, they, they understand that. And they say, you know, I'm really good with the mechanics, but I don't, I'm not great with the story. So what are some tips for that or vice versa? Uh, you know, I, I love telling the story, but the mechanics elude me. How can I get better at that? And so, you know, it's, it's just a learning process again, creating and failing and then trying again and failing better. Uh, to to go through these iterations and to go through drafts and to have play testers and to do all of these things that that help us learn uh how to do our craft as as best that we can uh so i don't know if i was specific in answering that question uh about what makes a good adventure but you know it's 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 a process as much as it is three simple tips <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And that, uh, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And you, and you mentioned a lot of pieces there, I think that, um, you know, that people should think about if they're, you know, trying to write an adventure, you have to think about story, drama, uh, characters, but also how you're presenting the material and how you're handling, you know, rules and mechanics. So that was really good. Oh, good. Um, and, you know, now at the beginning of the show, I mentioned, you know, just like a couple of uh, books that you have worked on you have now worked on quite a few books isn't that right uh yeah in fact whenever i do a uh, talk or an interview i have to bring up the uh, rpggeek.com which has like <laughs> lists of you know things that uh, role playing game designers have worked on because yeah. otherwise i will totally forget things that i've <laughs> that i've worked on but i can i can emphatically say that the things you mentioned yes i did work on <laughs> All right. Um, so then you said, you know, you, you kind of got in through organized play and doing some of that. And then you it led to to jobs and, you know, working actually for Wizards of the Coast um, and doing things. Um, uh, maybe let's just talk about a couple of the things that you have that you, you have worked on. What is uh, maybe for Dungeons and Dragons to start? What is something that you've worked on for Dungeons and Dragons that you are just really proud of? I'm going to start with just the sort of the very first thing I worked on, mm -hmm. uh, which w first one I got uh, real credit for uh, at the beginning of fourth edition, I was going to be an administrator in their upcoming, their new living forgotten realms organized play campaign. So I had play tests drafts of the rules and they needed content. So um, they couldn't go to just anybody because not everybody had the rules at that point. So it, it ended up, uh, they're like, uh, could you write an adventure for the first dragon magazine art, uh, Megan dragon magazine, uh, edition that's going to have fourth edition content. And I'm like, sure. And then they were like, oh, well, could you also need to write some adventures for this organized play campaign. And I said, Oh yeah, absolutely. And then they said, well, we also need someone to work on this hardcover book called dungeon delve. That is going to be a fourth edition book that we put out very early, uh, in fourth editions life cycle that has, uh, short adventures, almost like layers or mini adventures, uh, for all the levels. And could you work on that? And I'm sure, absolutely. And then, <laughs> then they said, well, we also have this adventure path. And uh, one of the writers that was supposed to write on uh, one of the modules had, we had to move them to a different project. So could you work on that? So I, I literally in the span of six months were, was working on four different projects for fourth edition, right at the very start. Uh, and, it was sink or swim, but it was one of those freelancer uh, 
credos where you just don't say no to work uh, yeah. <laughs> if you if you need it and if you want to keep working. So I I just said yes, and they just kept coming. And I was working with four different people at Wizards of the Coast uh, on these four different projects. And since it was so early in the um, in the in the life cycle of Fourth Edition, that I was getting conflicting instructions from these different oh, no. people. And, and so it was, <laughs> it, it, it's not unusual for, for this to happen, uh, mm-hmm. be, especially at the start of something. Uh, but yeah. it, it was just, it, it was a learning experience for me because you know, I would get one feedback from one manuscript saying, you know, there's way too much cowbell in this adventure. <laughs> and then the next you know, three days later, the feedback would come back on a different manuscript saying, you know what? We need more cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and it was, it turns out it was good advice all around because yes, the one, the one manuscript did need more cowbell and this other one needed less, but uh, it just, it showed that you need to be flexible. Uh, you need to do what's right for the project that's in front of you and not worry about, you know, what's going on. Uh, behind the scenes because that's going to work itself out without your input. Uh, so the, the thing that I really loved working on uh, most, I think was the dungeon delve book uh, because it's so, f- it's so fun to write an adventure that can be played in such a short amount of time, but still get all the components of a fun D and D game in. Uh, and, you know, you want some exploration you want some role playing and you want some combat and you want it to be easy for the dm to run but you also want it to be super engaging for the players and working on i think i worked on six of those layers out of that book and including the first level one so the first one that people would see when they opened it and it taught me so much about uh really you know getting to the the gist getting to the real pulp of what a fun adventure is. And that served me going forward as I wrote short adventures for fourth edition. And then for fifth edition, uh, you know, getting that one hour adventure concept down to something that uh, I felt comfortable writing and that people seem to enjoy running. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. I'm glad you kind of, uh, kind of, uh, uh, mentioned those different parts or different components of a D and D game there. That was really good. Um, and, and I, I'm also just thinking like when you were mentioning you, you had started doing all of those like four projects at one time, I was just like, are, were you still working a day job while oh, yeah. those? Yeah. yeah. And a yeah. family. Wow. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was, well, I, I've said it uh, several times. Let me explain again. I, if I don't write, I don't sleep. Okay. Um, and that's been something that's driven slash haunted slash helped me um, over the years is, mm-hmm. you know, even when I had a, a day job uh, at night for even if it's just an hour, I need to sit down and I need to to type out a story, type out something uh, just to just to get my brain in a space that can let things go. Uh, so even if I wasn't getting paid, even if I wasn't running a D and D game, I would be sitting down every night and writing something. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't, it, it was a lot, but it also, um, it was also therapeutically good for me and my family understands that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it it wasn't, I wasn't neglecting my family or anything. (laughs) Like, well, like that. What, I wasn't you, suggesting that. No, no. But it, it is it is a question, and it's a question I get a lot. You know, which is how, especially when you're a, a part time freelancer and have a full time job, how do you do it? And it's not easy. Uh, yeah. It's not not easy. And I you know I talk to people freelancers all the time about it, and you know how do you balance that work life load? And now as a as a person who has to oversee freelancers in my new job with Ghostfire Gaming. Uh, it's something I, I do need to worry about, right? I do need to, mm-hmm. when I contract someone for 10,000 words that's due in two weeks or three weeks, you know, can they be able to do it? Am I putting them, you know, in any danger physically, mentally, or socially oh, by, by asking this of them? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a thing that you need to be aware of in the industry. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know just from my experience, uh, starting to self-publish because I self-publish material. Um, I, you know, I, I basically worked two full-time jobs for like four years and, um, you say, how did you balance it? And it was like, not well, right. 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 (laughs) Not well, but it, you know, got through it. Right. (laughs) Right. It's, it, it, it's work. It's, you know, you, you, if you sit down and you have like a home game and you create your own content and your your own settings and your own story, you know that's that's great and you know how much work that takes. Yeah. Uh, now ramp it up for actually having to submit it to publishers, follow a style guide, be on a pretty strict schedule. You know that ramps it up even more. So it's, uh, you know, a lot of people who write their own stuff think it, that making that next next step to freelancing or self-publishing uh is is just the same thing and it's really not yeah yeah it's it's definitely a jump uh obviously i haven't done the freelancing side but the the self-publishing side it does um it 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 you know you have to treat it seriously right like if you if you want it to work but then uh you know obviously it's always you're balancing or juggling other things as well so it is um uh it is a a lot of time and a lot of work absolutely absolutely yeah. and and the one other risk is when you um when you do self publish or you do freelance and it takes all your time is you stop playing yeah and part of the joy of the game is playing the game, whether you're DMing or playing. And I, I know a lot of people who sort of lose their love for the game once they do start freelancing or self-publishing because they, because that joy of interacting with others and, and, you know, uh, being creative in, in the game space at the game table is the joy of the game for them. So, you know, going out of that, doing this work and then cutting yourself off from that joyful expression of the game can be devastating. So, you know, another tip out there for people that are creating, you know, keep playing the game. Don't, don't stop. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, I think that is great advice. And that um, I certainly went through that period as well, where it was just, um, it was just almost impossible to play, right? <laughs> like, yeah. um, um, just because I was so busy uh, doing, you know, kind of RPG related things, but mm-hmm. just not playing. Yeah, because, um, um, and I did get to kind of a point to where I was like, you know what, I need to play, you know, I need to, I need to yeah. play again. And so, uh, um, but yeah, I I think that is a great tip uh, out there. Um, I'd also add, if you're going to go the self-publishing route uh, on the first like 10 things that you publish, don't spend any money on them. Just <laughs> put your yeah. time into them um, yep. and, and try to figure out the, uh, the whole process before you spend money on stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good, uh, that's a very good piece of advice as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, now I had mentioned in the intro that you had worked on the Acquisitions Incorporated source book. Uh, why, why don't you tell us a little about that? How did that come about? And then um, uh, maybe frame it for somebody who doesn't know what uh, Acquisitions Incorporated is. All right. Let me start with the the, the last part. Uh, Acquisitions Incorporated is a live streamed game from PennyArcade.com. Uh, which is a web comic a store, a lot of different things. And at the end of fourth edition or in the middle of fourth edition, they ran a stream of the people from Penny Arcade playing uh, fourth edition D and D with Chris Perkins as the DM. I think James Wyatt was DM for them once or twice in there as well. And they just streamed that to, you know, as sort of advertising for Penny Arcade and adver- advertising for D&D. But it grew into a, a whole thing, if you will, uh, because they, as as players, they sort of glommed on to this idea of an adventuring party as a corporation. Mm-hmm. And so that corporation then uh, became the adventuring company, but the satire of cor- the corporate world uh, is heavy in the game. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that grew in popularity sort of in tandem with the popularity of D&D. And 
at one point, uh, Penny Arcade also runs several conventions around the the world. Uh, they are, for the most part, a, a Penny Arcade is a, a video game review site sort of thing, although they have other aspects of it. And so it's a very short step to being, you know, getting into role playing games uh, from video games. And at one of these Penny Arcade Expos, one of their big conventions, Wizards were, was partnered with Penny Arcade and they wanted uh, some very short one hour adventures, which I had gotten uh, used to writing, set in the Penny Arcade world in, in their sort of atmosphere. And so I did. And I had written a few of these, not for Penny Arcade, but just a few of these short one hour adventures for conventions. Uh, before and so i had it down and i wrote it and sort of brushed my hands and said okay great it was running at the penny arcade expo in seattle and so i sent it off and that was it i was i live on the other side of the country so i wasn't going to to seattle to this penny arcade expo and i thought okay that was it it was a fun project hopefully people liked it and and i'm done and i got a call from a friend of mine named Teos Abadia, who is also a podcast partner of mine and someone who I'd worked with on other projects before. And he was at Penny Arcade Expo. And he said, I just talked to Jerry Holkin, who is one of the two you know, leaders of Penny Arcade and one of the players of Acquisitions Incorporated. And I just happened to catch him at the bar, Teos told me, and he absolutely loves your adventure. And we might want to do something bigger. And I thought, great. And I think he called me and it was like, like 11 o'clock at night here because it was only you know eight o'clock at night <laughs> on the West coast. Yeah. So I, I was half awake. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, whatever. Bye. And Teos at, at that same convention had written a published module called uh storm King's bargain. And was it cloud? Cloud Giants Bargain, that's what it was. Cloud oh, okay. Giants Bargain. And that was the the time when Penny Arcade and Wizards actually live streamed the game that, that Chris Perkins ran at the convention into movie theaters everywhere around the country. <laughs> so Teos's adventure was given away at movie theaters, and my adventure was run uh, at the Penny Arcade Expo for new players, new to D and D, or new players who wanted to learn more about what Acquisitions Incorporated was. So it's sort of a comical uh, romp game, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, and so Teos told me this, and I was, you know, I was mildly interested, but you know, again, I had a full time job and I had other stuff, so I wasn't thinking about it because in this business, a lot of things are like, oh, we're going to do this great thing, and then it just never happens. And, you know, time passed and, and maybe it will, maybe it won't. And finally, uh, Teos and Jerry got together and they just said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this book and, uh, wizards won't be involved, but we're going to do it. We'll publish it under the open gaming license and it's going to be great. And I thought, all right, here we go. Let's do this. So I got all, uh, I got all excited and it just so happened that this was around 2018 and the company that I had worked for for 20 years had been purchased by another company and I was pretty much out of a job. Oh gosh. And, uh, but I took it as a sign that, Hey, it's time to go full time freelancer mm -hmm. and how, how better to start your full time freelance career than working on an acquisitions incorporated book you know, a super popular uh, D and D campaign stream. Uh, here we go. This is going to be great. And you know, it, it took a few months to get everything together. There were road bumps along the way, as there always are. And in the end, it turned out that Wizards of the Coast decided to publish the book uh, from the content that we created, which you know puts the Wizards of the Coast seal of approval on it, and they they get to review it, edit it and then uh and publish it so you know it was a it was a it was a super exciting experience sometimes i get so uh wrapped up in the business side of things that that i forget that this is a joyful thing mm 
Mm-hmm. And writing this book was probably the most fun I've had as a D&D designer because the the concept of this corporate spin on a D&D adventuring party is hilarious. And I worked in the corporate world for for many years. So I was steeped in this sort of you know, (laughs) Kafka-esque office space sort of, you know, view of how business works and how, you know, you can bang your head against the wall forever and not get anywhere. And the people above you may be, you know, you may think they're your boss, but they're also going to kill you if, if, (laughs) if you, if you allow them to work you to death. And, and so, you know, there's, there's all of that sort of comedic stuff but in the in the end it it really is a fun and dramatic way uh to play D &D because there's a lot of you know finagling of of ideas and of schemes and of plots and it just sort of adds this extra element that a lot of people miss in a regular D D campaign where it's just straight heroic things and you don't really think about what you're doing next. You just sort of follow the plot. Mm-hmm. Whereas in an acquisitions incorporated game, you know, you're a business. So you are trying to think of a way to expand or a way to get one up on your rival, you know, all of these things. And so that is built into the book of uh, this, this, uh, the idea of when you have downtime, you're using it to, to advance your business and uh, Teos worked very hard on on that aspect of it. And it, I use it in my regular campaigns now, you know, this sort of, what are you going to do now that you've defeated the big, bad, evil person at the end of this, you know, at the end of level three, now you're going to be level four, but you have a month. What are you going to do with that time? And you know, I want to make a magic item. I want to scout out our next possible mission. I want to carouse. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And and see what trouble I can get in. You know, all of those things are handled by those rules. And you know, Jerry uh and everybody at Penny Arcade made such a great uh setting and a great idea. And uh it was it was so much fun to sort of play in that space and and write some funny things rather than just straight sort of drama or horror or or those uh sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 well, I can only imagine. I think um, I, I've listened to uh, quite a bit of the acquisitions incorporated, at least some of the earlier ones and um, the streams. And uh, the the take is is pretty funny. It is yeah. it's really funny, and and uh, it, it's funny because, like, I mean, on multiple levels, I think because uh, you you are absolutely right. It puts a little different spin on kind of the fantasy world, and while poking fun at something that we're all kind kind of, you know, tired of the corporate yeah. world kind of falseness and fakeness of, of some of that. But it also played around with some things because like uh, just in different games that I had played that was just like, you know, my, our group came close to some of those things. We would always you know, every once in a while have somebody who was like, let's form a company and let's have our players form a company or, or something like this, but like really going after kind of the, you know, the corporation angle was really funny. And so uh, that is really neat. Yeah. Most of the, uh, most of the campaigns that I've been a part of, or just even one shots at conventions that I've run, mm -hmm. I would say like nine, not 90, but maybe 75% of, of the tables or of the campaigns are halfway there anyway, in terms of comedy, right? <laughs> it's, it's the, the, the comedy is always there, but it's usually an aside. It's usually you, you go off and you, you have your, you know, Monty Python quotes, or you have this yeah. little side rant and then you get back to the quote unquote serious game. Mm-hmm. And so this is just sort of leaning into it. This is just sort of owning the comedy right from the start and, and run with it and see where it leads you. Yeah. 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 And, um, and sometimes, you know, comedy can be a a little tricky, but uh, I thought acquisitions incorporated kind of hit the right kind of 
hit it right, you know, and, and um, I think it was something to do with that whole corporate world kind of thing. Like, yeah. oh, we're opening a branch office, <laughs> different things like that. I always thought was, was, was really You can fun. get your franchise now. Yes. <laughs> yes. You can open a franchise and all mm. kinds of stuff. Yeah. I thought that was, uh, I thought that was pretty good because it, it leaned, it leaned into the world of D and D like it didn't, you know, and just added a new element. It didn't like change things, you know, too much or something like that right you're right you're, you're still you know you're still trying to level and and get treasure and fight the bad guys and you you know you're still doing all those things so it at the essence it's still D straight up yeah yeah absolutely and um you know i know i've been talking to you for a while now but i want to get to a couple other things um i mentioned also that you had worked on star trek adventures um if you ask my wife i have a star trek problem um <laughs> although, although although she's a fan too so uh that, that's really really good because i think i may have a problem but so you worked on star trek adventures as yeah. well yep i uh i answered a call i think for they were looking for people to work on the game so i submitted my resume and and i ended up uh you know working on the game a bit and writing the adventure that's in the back of of the of the core book um, nice. and i you know, i really i've always thought that some some franchises some intellectual properties are tough to make a role playing game for because mm -hmm. the stories have already been told and there isn't a lot of room to tell the stories that you want to tell. Um, I, for some reason, that's always for me why like D and D is super popular because it's not based on one property. It's yeah. based on many books, many, and not even any real movies, right? It, it goes all the way back to, to Conan and to Lord of the Rings and to, to those books that are, are, are delivered via imagination to start with because they're not or haven't hadn't been at that point concretized onto the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I Star Wars or Star Trek for me was one that I thought could you could tell good stories with it. Uh, there was enough out there. It was a wide enough world and it was an it was a basic enough story at the root of, of star, star Trek adventures that, that you could do it. And so uh, that's what turned me on to the, the game. And I love the, the 2d 20 system that they use for, uh, you know, for resolving tasks and telling stories. Mm -hmm. And so my job then was to write an adventure uh, that people would be using when they first picked up the book, probably to make that story happen, to show how to tell those stories. And hopefully I did an okay job. <laughs> no, I'm sure you did. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I take it you were a Star Trek fan before. Oh yeah. Yep. I, yeah. I don't, I don't know that I have a problem, uh, <laughs> but I can definitely see problems in my future uh, with like Picard, season two coming out soon uh -huh. and uh yeah no but i you know i've always been a f fan if in in the wars versus trek debate i sadly for some people come down on the trek side mm -hmm. uh just because i love that uh i love the the ideas behind it i love the stories that 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 star trek tells yeah um, so yeah yeah absolutely i i think um um it just speaks to, I mean, not only kind of the optimism, but the um, the idea that you know that Kirk and and Chekhov and Sulu and some of the others they're just they're just people who right. work really hard and are good at their jobs, and um, you know it's not like um, you're the chosen one, right? <laughs> like, exactly. You know, so I, I think there, you know, while, while I love star Wars, you know, there is an appeal to star Trek that is, um, I don't know. It just appeals like on a very human level, I think. Yeah. The, the idea that we can, we can have faults, yeah. but still overcome those faults altogether to, yeah. to make a world that everyone can live in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, always appealed to me 
and you know, I, I, that's what D and D is for me yeah. and always has been it are, you know, maybe you are a superhero quote unquote, because your character has all can cast spells and do amazing things, mm-hmm. but there's also flaws in in your character and you need those other people, or there are weaknesses in your character or weaknesses in your abilities. And you need, you know, the barbarian needs the wizard when the barbarian gets a spell cast on, on her to, to break that spell mm-hmm. or to handle the magical trap when the barbarians uh, attempt to beat on it does not go well. Uh, yeah. And and so, you know, that, that feeling of community and that, that social aspect has always been appealing to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and now, I mean, I could keep asking you a million questions, but like, we haven't even talked about your podcast. Uh, oh, you boy. do a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you so, tell us a little about your, your podcast? Sure. Uh, the podcast is called Mastering Dungeons. It is on the Misdirected Mark Network, and it is one that we do weekly. Uh, I do it with Teos Abadia, who I'd mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And essentially why we do it is because if we don't force ourselves to stop and look at the D&D world news or read the latest book, we will be so busy writing that we never look at it and it's important that we do. So for, for, I think I can speak for Teos when I say it's, it's our excuse to put down work for a couple hours, read over the latest news or read over the latest Kickstarter, big Kickstarter release or, or the latest wizards of the coast product and, you know, really analyze it as we should. So, uh, yeah, you can catch that at, uh, misdirectedmark.com uh, there's several shows in that network but uh you can check out ours there okay great and uh what else are you working on right now in january i became lead what's my title executive lead <laughs> designer at ghostfire gaming which is an australian company that founded a couple just a couple years ago uh printing publishing um 5e material and i had no plans to look for full-time work in the industry i was very happy as a full-time freelancer but when i talked to the principals at the company and they told me their plan their like long-term five-year plan i went i need to be part of this and so i started in january we just finished our the first Kickstarter for which I was lead designer ended a few weeks ago. It's called uh, the monster grimoire. The, uh, the world is called grim hollow and the book is called the monster grimoire. Uh, The Kickstarter ended unfortunately, but the book will be out in a few months um, since it takes time to, to make these things I'm come to find out. Uh, <laughs> but I really love the, the world that they created in Grim Hollow. Uh, I love the ideas that they, they have. And we're expanding to offer what we're calling Forged with Ghostfire partnerships. So if, you know, if we see a, a, an idea out there that some designer has and they might not have the means to put on a full Kickstarter, uh, we have the means of doing maps and dice and minis and you know all sorts of supplements and and knickknacks and all the cool accessories that uh, go with D and D. You know we can do that, and we have a Kickstarter coming up soon with a, a podcast called the Dungeon Dudes. Mm. Uh, they're creating a a big adventure setting called Drakenheim. Um, so we're publishing that with them the kickstarter might be over by the time this comes out or be close to over but you know that'll be available obviously for to buy once it's done uh but i'm you know i get to work now full time with a bunch of freelancers and people with great ideas and reading and designing my own stuff as well it's it's uh it's been the best of both worlds in terms of having a full-time job and also getting to work on D stuff so i am super happy to to be working with ghostfire 
Yeah, that sounds amazing. And I'll, I will make sure and I will put links to um, some of your books and to your podcast and uh, to Ghostfire in the uh, show notes uh, for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. So anybody out there listening right now uh, can just head over to DiceGeeks.com and find the show notes for this episode and you will be able to find those links. Well, Sean, like I said, I, I could talk to you all day, but I will respect your time um, when I get talking RPGs. I got, I kind of go crazy. So, um, well, just thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me. I also could spend hours talking and if we're ever at a convention together, uh, after hours, we'll sit down and talk. How's that sound? That sounds great. All right. All right, guys, there you have it. It was such a pleasure being able to speak with Sean today. We talked for nearly an hour and barely just scratch the surface of his RPG and writing knowledge, but I hope you were able to glean some bits out of the episode where he talked about adventure writing and some of his advice about running games. As I mentioned in the episode, I have provided links to some of Sean's books as well as the company Ghostfire, which he now works for in the show notes for this episode. So I've put the links there just head over to DiceGeeks.com, find the show notes, and you'll be able to look up uh, some of Sean's amazing, amazing work. All right, guys. If you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you'll get an email update from me letting you know what's going on in the world of Dice Geeks. All right, guys. This is usually where I give the pitch about supporting the show. I did that at the beginning because it's the 100th episode. Oh my gosh. So I won't give the pitch again, but if you can support the show in some way, please do so. I thank you so much for listening, guys. Um, it is a pleasure to uh, be in your earbuds or wherever <laughs> each and every Wednesday. So I thank you. Thank you so much. So until next time, keep gaming.